Now, last Sunday morning, I attended uh, a Uniting Church Community housing forum in, P in Penrith, Western Sydney. Uh, the forum was organized by the Uniting Church and the Sydney Alliance Coalition, a coalition of 40 non-for-profit community education and union organizations. At that conference, there was presentations on housing and homelessness uh, by community organizations, Penrith Council, academics, and political parties. Uh, the Greens were there and are here again uh, today. Uh, unfortunately, no one from the coalition uh, felt it was important enough to attend. Uh, a report was given uh, on the results of 628 face-to-face -face conversations uh, that took place on March the 17th, 2018, with Penrith residents and visitors to Penrith. 131 volunteers uh, conducted sampling by door knocking, select, by door knocking, selected interviews uh, in different areas through Penrith, and uh, walk, doing walk-up interviews, uh, interviews at sporting fields, shopping centres, and market stalls. Uh, the age distribution of the sample closely resembles that of the ABS 2016 census for the Penrith LGA for people aged 18 and over. Now, the key results were as follows. 82% uh, uh, were concerned about the lack of affordable rental housing in Western Sydney. 97% agreed that everyone has, the, has a right to affordable rental housing. 98% agreed everyone has a right to secure housing. 70% uh, disagree that it is easy for low-income people to find rental housing. 87% said that new housing developments in Western Sydney should include units that lower income people can afford to rent. And 82% disagreed that landlords should be able to evict tenants without giving any good reason. 72% disagreed that the New South Wales Liberal government was doing enough to make housing more affordable. Now, I think this could be replicated across the country. You know, affordable, affordability, housing security, the need for more rental accommodation, and concern that the political class are not doing enough on a housing affordability would, in my view, be resonating across the country. Contributions from the floor of the forum identified issues such as the lack of public transport, lengthy commute to work, uh, concerns that young people in Western Sydney are being locked out of the housing market. None of this would be alien to those attending this conference, and these results could be replicated nationwide. And the 2016 census, you know, the stats are, all, again, very concerning. 116,427 people enumerated in the, Senate, se the census who are classified as being homeless on census night. The homeless rate rose by 27% in New South Wales, while falls of 11% in Western Australia, uh, the, Northern, uh, the Northern Territory and, and Capital, the ACT, fell by 17%. Most of the increase in homelessness between 2011 and six, uh, 2016 was reflected in persons living in severely crowded dwellings. Homelessness youth aged 12 to 24 years made up 32% of the total of homeless persons living in severely crowded dwellings. The number of homeless persons aged 55 years and above has steadily increased over the last three censuses. Now, an Anglicare survey shows that less than 1% of homes for rent in Greater Sydney are affordable for households on low incomes. In most of the capital cities, rental vacancies rates are below 2%. While housing construction activity in 2016-17 kept pace with population growth, this didn't dampen the pent-up demand generated by years of underbuilding in the affordable housing sector. <laughs> housing affordability continues to be a significant problem. As Professor Duncan McLennan has said, housing is one of the largest contributors to intergenerational inequality. Young Australians are finding it almost impossible 
to access the housing market. Many young Australians will spend most of their lives in the private rental sector. The International Monetary Fund found Australia has one of the highest house price to income ratios in the world. And now prior to the 2017 budget, uh, Minister Sukar told Sky News, and I quote, the housing package will be extraordinarily, extraordinarily large. It will be far reaching. It will deal with all the groups in the spectrum of housing. It will be an impressive package. It will be a well-received package. Well, Minister, you got it wrong. Uh, John Daly from the Grattan Institute said, and I quote, you'll need a scanning electron microscope to see an impact on prices. I can't see any reason why this budget is going to make a discernible difference to housing affordability, a discernible difference on the number of young people that buy a house. Adrian Pizarski from National Shelter said, it's a centerpiece without a centerpiece. Homelessness Australia said the budget fails to deliver the big picture solutions needed to end homelessness. This budget is not fair because it fails to fix a broken housing system that encourages investors to own more than one house while 105,000 have no home at all. James Toomey from Mission Australia said, disappointingly, the budget contains inadequate assistance for the many people in rental stress who remain just one step away from homelessness. And Richard Holden, Professor of Economics at the University of New South Wales, said this, Yet the measures in the budget involve not much more than tinkering. But the biggest minus of all was the absence of any measure whatsoever to address negative gearing and capital gains tax exemptions for rental property. And a first home buyer, Bree Maher, commenting on the salary sacrifice superannuation measure said, it wouldn't even cover your stamp duty. So this so-called extraordinarily large, far-reaching housing package didn't exactly knock the socks off community organizations, academics, or younger people trying to buy their first home. When young people are lining up against housing investors in an attempt to buy their first home, it's outrageous that investors are using government tax concessions to outbid them and leave their dreams shattered. A housing package that fails to deal with negative gearing and capital gains tax exemptions is an ineffectual and inferior package. It was reported last week that a number of liberal politicians, including Michaelia Cash, uh, has, have penned essays eulogizing Bob Menzies' forgotten people speech. I also note that former treasurer Peter Costello has described Australians who earn $200,000 as the forgotten people. I've never been a fan of Peter Costello, a weak treasurer who stood by while John Howard baked in an unsustainable structural deficit as a result of attempting to buy the votes of middle class and wealthy Australians. We are still paying the price for this economic incompetence today. Under Peter Costello, the coalition government showered financial largesse on middle class and wealthy Australians. The real forgotten people in this country are indigenous Australians who have government support in housing and health ripped away as part of the government's unfair austerity programs. The real forgotten people in this country are working class households in rental and mortgage stress. The real forgotten people in this country are the low income families who have lost their penalty rates and are struggling to put food on the table for their kids. The real forgotten people are the young Australians who will never own their own home and will be hostage to a rental housing market that is not fit for purpose. In his Forgotten People's speech, Menzies positioned home ownership as the basis of a stable society. It's not often I quote Bob Menzies, but I will now. He said this, the home is the foundation of sanity and sobriety. It is the indispensable condition of continuity its health determines the health of a society as a whole. He certainly didn't think that the rich and powerful needed a leg up. He said of them in the Forgotten People's speech, and I quote, in most material difficulties, the rich can look after themselves. So much for Peter Costello's positioning 
of Australians earning $200,000 as the forgotten people. The Prime Minister, in his insensitive and arrogant comments to John Fain, that John Fain should just shell out and provide a bit of intergenerational equity in the Fain family so that his kids could enter the housing market, shows just how out of touch this Prime Minister and his government is. Former Treasurer Joe Hawkey, who introduced the concept of lifters and leaners in his disastrous 2014-15 budget, advised prospective home buyers to, and I quote, get a good job that pays good money if you want to enter the property market. Not bad for a politician who retired in financial security due to the now defunct and generous defined benefit superannuation scheme and moved seamlessly to enhance his retirement benefits with a stint as ambassador to the US. Not bad for someone who would dare call some other people leaners. Coalition politicians, in my view, are divorced from reality and the struggles of working class Australians. It's over 12 months since the 2017 budget decision to establish a bond aggregator through the National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation Bill 2018. The Treasury Laws Amendment to that legislation uh, has been passed, however, not one state government uh, has signed on. That's the National Housing and Homelessness Ag Agreement. Not one state has so far signed on. I expect that some state governments will sign off eventually, uh, even though they are concerned with aspects of the NHHA. Labour recognises the inequities in our taxation and housing systems. Budgets and taxation are a demonstration of the priorities of a government. Labour believes there are many priorities in housing, homelessness, health, education and infrastructure that should be addressed prior to costing the budget $80 billion to cut business tax for multinational corporations as well as $17 billion of tax relief to the banking sector. Trickle-down economics does not work. And this is a desperation tactic from a deflated, despondent and rudderless government. This government's economic plans, and I use the word loosely, have ranged from austerity budgets in 1415, increasing the GST, handing taxing powers to the states, and now they've moved on to trickle-down economics. In contrast, the shortened opposition is united and focused on developing policies that balance the economic imperatives of the nation with the social needs of the community. When last in government, we took the following initiatives towards addressing housing affordability and homelessness. We produced the Road Home White Paper on housing and homelessness and developed national strategies and targets to reduce homelessness. We committed to the Housing Help for Seniors pilot. We invested $5.6 billion in the Social Housing Initiative which delivered around 20,000 new homes, funded repairs and maintenance to 80,000 more, and supported 90,000 jobs through the global financial crisis. We provided $6 billion to the state and territories for affordable housing. We negotiated the National Partnership on Homelessness, which provided the state and territory governments with over $1 billion for reducing homelessness. We established the National Rental Affordability Scheme, which, which had provided 30,000 new affordable rental housing units. The NRAS was on track to deliver 50,000 new affordable rental dwellings, and the level of demand was such that it could have been extended by a further 35,000 dwellings. We established the National Housing Supply Council. How can you make decisions if there's a, an information asymmetry, if you don't know what's happening, if you don't address the key issues. And we also appointed a dedicated minister for housing and homelessness. In opposition, we have announced reform to negative gearing and capital gains tax concessions, the facilitation of a co-ag process to introduce a uniform vacant property tax across all major cities, limiting direct borrowing by self-managed superannuation funds as recommended by the 2014 Financial Systems Inquiry. Uh, we have increased foreign invest, we will increase foreign investor fees and penalties. We, have, we, have, we will establish a bond aggregator to increase investment in affordable housing. We will boost homelessness support 
for vulnerable Australians. We are committed to achieving better results from the National Housing and Homelessness Agreement. We will re-establish the National Housing Supply Council and we will appoint a Minister for Housing and Homelessness so that that issue is always uh, before the uh, Cabinet and uh, the Ministry. Now, Labour's package would see the construction of over 55,000 new homes over three years and boost employment by 25,000 new jobs a year. Since this announcement, Shadow Treasurer Chris Bowen has announced two major tax initiatives in addition to our previously announced tax policy. That is the removal of imputation credit refunds and the introduction of an Australian investment guarantee, a form of accelerated depreciation. As Chris Bowen said on March the 5th, 2018, an important part of any sensible fiscal strategy is identifying those tax concessions which eat away at the revenue base and reform them, or abolish them in order to underpin budget repair and the funding of new initiatives. The difficult taxation decisions that we have made will allow Labour to do more on social issues such as housing. Labour has, identified, uh, has indicated that we will have more to say on housing and homelessness policy. I don't have any new announcements today, but we definitely will have more announcements on housing and homelessness before the next election. We have conducted, Labour has conducted a number of housing and homelessness forums across the country. We have engaged and consulted with faith-based groups in relation to assessing and accessing church land for low-income housing. Labour believes that we can reach mutually beneficial agreements with church groups that provide increased housing stock and reliable income streams to religious organisations. We have had a number of roundtables with the industry superannuation funds designed to increase institutional investment in community housing. This can be done while meeting the obligation of the sole purpose test. Government has a role beyond the bond aggregator to ensure that lower income individuals and families can benefit from institutional investment in community housing. Government can play a role with superannuation funds by working towards developing a risk-adjusted rate of return on affordable housing that encourages institutional investment. This would improve outcomes and ensure industry fund members achieve a comfortable retirement with the superannuation funds helping deliver economic and social outcomes which maximise long-term retirement benefits. The growing trend of workers retiring while still paying off a mortgage results in superannuation savings being used to pay the mortgage off. This diminishes the capacity for individuals to retire securely outside the government pension system. Australian industry superannuation funds already invest in social housing in the US and UK, and it's time government, the community housing sector, and the superannuation funds work together to increase superannuation fund investment in low-income housing stock for the benefit of fund members. A government-guaranteed asset class in, the, in community housing can deliver long-term stable returns to the funds with benefits to individual fund members and the community. There's a growing recognition that failure to meet the challenge of housing and homelessness will result in increased intergenerational inequality, growing social unrest, and increasing cost to government through the health and justice systems. The Commonwealth cannot continue to blame state and territory governments and local councils for lack of, of, suitable, uh, of supply of suitable and affordable housing. A concerted effort to develop a national housing strategy that includes all levels of government, business, the finance sector and the superannuation industry is fundamental to addressing what for many are the unsurmountable challenges in accessing an affordable roof over their head. All options should be on the table, including inclusionary zoning, build to rent, shared ownership and increased rights for tenants. Labour shares the concerns of excluding build to rent from managed investment trusts as there is a need to increase housing stock across the continuum. If we are serious about increasing housing supply, 
improving productivity and helping the disadvantaged in our community, then the government must address the funding gap, the yield gap that still exists following the introduction of a bond aggregator. Even coalition senators on the bond aggregator inquiry noted the submissions from the community housing sector on the need to fund the gap. Now, Labour will cont continue to develop our policies and priorities in relation to taxation and housing. However, we do not believe an $80 billion handout to overseas corporations, big business and banks should be prioritised over the need to address affordable housing supply. Thank you. We have time for just one or two questions for Senator Cameron. Uh, do we have, uh, raise your hand if you have a question or comment, we'll get a microphone to you. Having trouble seeing in the darkness. One up the back there, and then another one down here. Uh, thank you, Senator, for your words. Um, Andrew Hollows from Launch Housing. Um, just, I guess, a two-part question, Senator. In regards to the yield gap, our concern as a homelessness agency is, I guess, what we call the bottom 10% who still may not get access to community housing through the bond aggregator just because of their current and future income prospects. So a response from you, Senator, around that would be appreciated, but also, I guess, in the context around the current level or the inadequate level of the Commonwealth rent assistance as well. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, so firstly, on, the, um, on the, uh, the yield gap, because that's the issue uh, why you can't build community housing for that bottom 10% uh, of uh, low income and maybe even social security recipients. Th this is a big issue, an issue that Labour is concerned about. When we were last in government, the NRAS scheme uh, helped bring down the cost of building, allowed a 20% discount uh, on, uh, on the, uh, the rent that people paid, allowed people to get into areas that they would not normally get into, be close to work, increase productivity, because housing is a big productivity issue. It's a big economic issue. So we believe that the investment that you make uh, to try and get more people into housing will have a, a, a benefit in other areas of the budget. So we take the view that uh, you do have to, to address the yield gap. Even the coalition senators on the inquiry uh, into the bond aggregator recognised that position. All of the submissions said the yield gap had to be dealt with. I haven't heard anything from the government. Maybe the minister will make an announcement this morning to take us on a sensible path. Uh, down that track, but uh, that is absolutely essential. At the moment, the government is saying nothing about it. We will have something to say about it prior to the next election. On Commonwealth rent assistance, it's growing at 7% uh, per annum, uh, and this has to be dealt with in the context of making sure that we do increase supply. It's no good for state governments just to simply you know, hand uh, management over to the uh, uh, the community housing sector without handing over deeds, without handing over titles, without making sure that uh, you know, there is a, a net a benefit for the community housing sector to go down that track. So I understand that uh, there are big issues here. I mean, I was brought up in what was called the prefabs uh, just outside Glasgow. Uh, you know, these were like big caravans without, heat, without wheels freezing cold in the winter, hot in those couple of days of summer that we got in Glasgow. And, um, you, know, these, uh, you know, these were temporary accommodation before the big investment in public housing. Now, there's been no investment made in public housing in this country of any substance for years. So these are issues that we would want to sit down with the states, uh, the, the territories, uh, with business, with the finance sector to look at how we can get more investment going. Thank you. And then very quickly, Adrian Pasarski from Shelter Australia. Thank you, Michael. Um, thanks, Senator Cameron. Um, I was just going to ask a quick question about um, the election timing or the, the by-election timing is now clashing with the ALP conference. We had been hoping that the ALP conference might um, throw a bit more light on Labor's policies around housing. I'm just wondering 
Is there now a timetable or a different timetable for announcing Labor's policies ahead of the next federal election? Will that be an issue for, uh, for Bill in the shadow cabinet? Certainly not for me. Uh, but uh, you know, I think uh, you know, you, you've seen what we've done in government. We treat housing, we treat homelessness seriously. That's why we have a minister to, in there, to get in there and argue those points. You see what we've done when we were in government. We understand that getting a roof over your head is absolutely essential. As for future announcements, that's not in my hands. But we will be making future announcements on housing and homelessness because you have to deal with the yield gap. Any, any policy that doesn't deal with capital gains tax, negative gearing in the yield gap is not worth calling a policy. Please join me in thanking Senator Doug Cameron.